Did the ancient Greeks and Romans invent the original whammy bar? The vibrato mechanism, so typical of the iconic modern day Fender electric guitar? Well, I recently found a detailed painting of a Roman kithara. That's um, the type of lyre played by the professional musicians of classical antiquity. And it was miraculously preserved in a fresco from 1st century Herculaneum, which initially seemed to suggest just this fact. Indeed, I posted a photo of this elusive painting um, for the modern day ma um, liar making luthiers to examine for themselves um, on the Facebook group called The Liar. And here's what one of these luthiers called Peter Pringle had to say. The really astonishing thing about this wonderful fresco from Herculaneum is the obvious presence of what can only be described as a whammy bar on the lyre. Not only are we looking at a whammy bar, but the left hand of a child, possibly a cupid, who is playing the instrument is actually pressing down on it as he actively strums the strings with, his, with the plectrum. The lyre has 14 strings that lie over a flat bridge and wrap onto what appears to be a spring mechanism. The artist is showing us a good deal of detail and you can see that the whammy ensemble consists of two parts. An upper bar to which the strings are attached and two slightly raised arms and a lower part that acts as the spring. The action would be similar to two pairs of tweezers lying on a, twe on a table with their open ends joined with a pencil. Push downward on the pencil and the tweezers close. Release the pressure and they open up again, pushing the pencil back up to its original position. The artist, obviously a master painter, has even given us enough perspective to see the upward curve of the feet of the lower part of the spring, i.e. the tweezers, in the open position. By depressing either one of the two upper whammy arms, the pitch of the strings would sharpen, possibly as much as a semitone. This would facilitate all sorts of interesting ornaments and effects, including vibrato. Another interesting detail the artist has given us is the colour of the whammy device. In contrast to the rest of the instrument, it is quite evidently made of a white shiny metal, possibly silver. This is a fascinating discovery, and I have no doubt whatsoever that what we are looking at is what I have described above. Here is my own sketch based on the fresco showing the mechanism. The Romans used this type of spring for all sorts of other things, box lids, tongs, hairpins, latches, locks, tweezers, forceps, medical devices, even other musical instruments, but this is the first time I have heard of it being used on a lyre. The most compelling argument in favour of this hypothesis is the evidence of a similar complex spring-based vibrato mechanism that might have been used on the ancient Greek Cathara several centuries earlier from around 500 BC. Indeed, there is an academic paper by a chap called Pavel um, Kerfurst entitled The Ancient Greek Cathara, and that was published in 1992, which explains in detail his own hypothesis that depictions of the ancient Greek Cathara show a combination of disc-shaped weights at the ends of the crossbar, sometimes called the yoke, and whose inertia, when the kithara was rocked by the musician, could be used to create a vibrato effect, and that the curly structures beneath the crossbar were springs whose function it was to return these weights to their original position once they had been rocked out. Quoting from Kerfhurst's paper, the ancient Greek kithara makers devised a number of systems for enabling the crossbar and weights to move in relation to the arms of the instrument. Judging from the dating of the iconograms in which type this type of kithara is shown, all of these systems seem to have been used at the same time. But first let us turn to a description of how the instrument and its individual parts functioned. The crossbar and the weights, that's these disc-shaped weights at either end of the crossbar, according to um, uh, Kerr first, attached at the joints to the end of the kithara arms, were able to rock out in both directions from the vertical axis of the instrument. 
Whenever this happened, the crossbar, which passed through the weights in such a way that it could move, shifted a few millimetres towards the body of the instrument. This resulted in a temporary shortening of the strings, or rather, a decrease in their tension, and had the effect of lowering their pitch. Depending on how far the weights were rocked out, the pitch of the strings could be lowered smoothly by almost three tones, which meant that the player could employ endless number of tones, ranging from the highest to the lowest pitch strings. The stability of the basic tuning of the kithara strings, i.e. when the weights were more or less perpendicular to the crossbar, was ensured by the continuous pull of the strings in the direction of the longer axis of the instrument, as well as by the operation of the symmetrical spring mechanism, linking the individual weights with their arms. The main function of the spring mechanism was to maintain the stability and to speed up the return of the weights to their original position after they had been rocked out. This is how um, Kerr first theorised how the vibrato mechanism could actually be set in motion. Basically, there were two means of achieving this. The player used his chin, nose or cheekbone to push against the disc fixed to the end of the crossbar. In this way, moving it and the weights away from himself. At the same time, he kept the instrument in the same position relative to his body. At first, the kinetic inertia of the relatively heavy weights would be too great for the force being exerted by the player, but once this had been overcome, it would itself contribute to the smooth and relatively slow movement of the crossbar. When playing the instrument in this way, the kithara player had two possibilities. He could either shift the crossbar to certain points, thus producing precise tones or achieve a glissando effect by continuing to move the crossbar smoothly. At the same time, the spring mechanism and the continuous pull of the strings would act to return the crossbar to its position of rest. With the second method of playing the kithara, a tremolo could be created um, with either very slight variations in pitch or large, um, large variations covering a, a range up to approximately three tones. When using this method, the kithara player would set the weights oscillating by moving the whole instrument at right angles to his body, in this way making use of the inertia of the weights which would have a tendency to remain in their initial position. After they had been set in motion, the weights and crossbar would be kept moving by impulses from the impact of the spring mechanism, as well as by occasional movements of the body of the kithara by the player. Of course, it would also have been possible to play the instrument without making use of the movable mechanism. In this case, it would have been like playing the lyre, barbiton or formix. Um, in this section of the paper, um, um, Kerfhurst theorised that the vibrato mechanism could be operated by the momentum of the player, maybe throwing the kithara forward. However, I would tend to disagree with this rather strange hypothesis, because due to my own actual practical experience of playing a replica kithara, due to the strong downward pull and the combined tension of the strings, even with low tension gut, this would be well over 100 pounds of pressure, in order to let inertia displace the yoke and set, the, set into operation the spring um, vibrato mechanisms, the discs either side of the yoke would have to be very heavy indeed and made of metal. Now speaking as a practical musician rather than a musicologist, this would render the beautifully light and resonant construction of the cathara so top-heavy that the instrument would be literally virtually unplayable. Also, if metal disc-shaped weights were used, um, according to um, the theory expounded in that paper, um, then then these would have, then these discs made of metal would survive the ravages of time, and many such discs would have been found in ancient Greek grave goods, where it is very likely that the revered musical instruments such as the kithara may well have been placed. Um, so, <laughs> no such curious metallic discs have ever been found in any ancient Greek grave goods. 
so far excavated. So I'm not too sure what to make of um, the rather bizarre theory, <laughs> the, the intricate theory um, expounded by um, Kerfhurst. However, there are further circumstantial evidence in support of some sort of vibrato mechanism on the ancient Greek Cathara, because in most of the depictions you can see of the ancient Greek Cathara, usually on vases and things, there seems to be illustrations of what appear to be hinges, um, allowing full articulation of the yoke at its thinnest sections. Whenever light lateral pressure is applied to either of the vertical beams extending from the yoke. Now, although there is no explicit reference to any sort of vibrato mechanism um, seen in, in illustrations of the ancient Greek Cathara, there are indeed some subtle hints to its existence in some surviving examples of ancient Greek texts. Indeed, there is such a passage in which the term, uh, the ancient Greek term pronounced kamphi is used, which literally means to bend or modulate. Um, and the term is used by the, the ancient Greek writer Aristophanes in his um, work Clouds. Um, that's line 971. In this passage, you're describing boys who, in their lyre lessons, were introduced to um, bends in the singing style of a famous Cathara player called Aprinus, um, who was famous from around the 440s BC. The boys, of course, would probably be using tortoiseshell lyres, but it would make sense if they were trying to reproduce um, what they saw the rock stars of their age doing. And this is, of course, possible to bend the frame, arms and yoke of an amateur lyre, such as a tortoiseshell lyre, in a rough imitation of the alleged vibrato mechanism of the kithara of the professional musicians of the ancient Greek system. And to quote from Aristophanes' Clouds line 971, And if any boy engaged in classroom buffoonery or attempting to torture the music by singing in the cacophonic newfangled style of that awful lyre player, Prinus. Prinus introduced um, modulations or bends of harmony and rhythm into the traditional music of the Cathara. He was given a damn good thrashing for deliberately, deliberately perverting the muses. <laughs> Besides this um, reference in the ancient Greek literature, we can also look at the ancient Greek forminx which is an early form of Cathara popular at the time of Homer. Almost every original ancient illustration of the formix also appears to indicate that the arms of this lyre were articulated or hinged, if you like, allowing the necessary movement required for a vibrato effect. Intrigued by all the varying arguments for and against some sort of vibrato mechanism, the Cathara of ancient Greece and, Greece and Rome, I sought to seek a more academically informed opinion and received just that from Professor Stephen Hegel. Regarding the vibrato mechanism of the ancient Greek Cathara, Hegel kindly pointed out to me an academic paper which I knew nothing of called The Arm Crossbird Junction of the Classical Hellenic Cathara by Stelios Pesardakes. In short, this fascinating paper refers to an actual 3D sculpture of an ancient Greek Cathara, found as part of the Parthenon frieze, in which, to quote, the intersection of the arm with the crossbar is carefully modelled, and so is the elaborate snake-like construction beneath it. This unique 3D ancient depiction of the Cathara is unique in that it clearly shows that instead of there being a movable floating yoke or crossbar necessary for a vibrato mechanism, to quote from the paper, it, it is here shown clearly that the crossbar surrounds the arm. In other words, the arm penetrates the crossbar. Therefore, the upper arm of the Cathara would have undoubtedly been solid, a wooden plank, not a deep hollow resonator. 
as it is unanimously believed. So rather than the high, rather than the hypothetical function of um, the mechanism of structures beneath the yoke being interpreted as a vibrato system, according to the, this paper, the actual function of these structures becomes apparent from the 3D sculpture. And to quote again from that paper, the right end of the base of the upper arm rests on the bow, which in turn is propped up by the elaborate system of capital column ba base head horseshoe buttresses, which leans against the inner wall of the lower arm. Undoubtedly, the function of this system is to provide reaction in the opposite direction to that of the tension of the strings. So that was, according to this paper, the actual function of these strange spring-like structures beneath um, the crossbar. Now back to the um, Herculaneum Kithara and the alleged whammy bar <laughs> interpretation by Peter Pringle. Um, Stefan Hegel offered me the following informative counter-argument. Um, the whammy bars are actually, according to Hegel, two levers that press the bridge against the soundboard by means of string tension, and they are definitely not being manipulated by the cupid. And his left arm is situated toward the viewer, far away from the instrument behind. Look at the whole picture, not only the hand. Finally, note how the supposed mechanism of the classical Greek cathara is still there by and large, but here clearly shown as mere decoration, which I have little doubt it had been at all times. Regarding the first century Roman cathara then, although no certain conclusion can be reached in interpreting, interpreting what these detailed paintings of curious metal whammy bars actually are on the um, the Roman Cathara as depicted from the Herculaneum fresco. I think we can say with some certainty though that these incredibly detailed frescoes shed yet more light on the fact that both the music and musical instruments of the ancient world were far more developed, intricate and complex than is commonly assumed. Um, the same can be said of the string, sorry, the spring vibrato mechanism theory to explain the intricate curved structures seen in all the countless illustrations which have survived of the Cathara of the classical Greece. Now, although there is no definitive proof discovered of an actual vibrato technique described in any ancient Greek text, it is clearly evident that these structures must have been so carefully designed to have at least some function in mind. It is just interpreting this function which, for um, the modern musician, is the problem. Indeed, the most frustrating aspect of interpreting ancient musical artefacts is that because these wonderful instruments are at least 2,000 years away in time from, from our own present experience of modern musical instruments and have not been played for at least 2,000 years, even with all or most of the artefacts present, on some points all we rarely have in the way of actually being able to interpret these artefacts are good old fashioned philosophical argument and counter arguments. It is rather like expecting an ancient Roman soldier from the first century to interpret the function of one of our 21st century smartphones.